if you feel ready, I feel ready. Put that over the side here. Okay. Good to go. Thanks, Andy. Okay, get this to work now. Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and begin. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, my name is Art Heinricher. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Studies. Also on the, the Zoom call today is Paul Riley, who's the Assistant Dean and the Director of the Academic Advising Office. Christine Sherry from Student Affairs is also here. Um, we've got a presentation we're going to go through. My goal is to have lots of time for questions. You can put questions in the chat anytime. We will try to answer as many of those as we can today, but we'll also record them. And if you give us information there that allows us to, to connect back to you, we will respond on email as soon as we can. Um, so welcome. This is an overview of academic programs at WPI. First of all, first thing I wanna say is congratulations and welcome. You know, probably we have about 1300 first year students this year, more than 11,000 applicants. About half of those students have never seen a B before in their life. You know, one of the, the jokes our former president used to make is that was a problem we would solve fairly quickly. But the point that I wanna emphasize is what I know is behind that is hundreds of thousands of hours of science fairs and homework, right. titles and parents nights. And I think you, know, you should be very, very proud of your accomplishment. Your, your sons and daughters, your students have done amazing things, and we look forward to meeting them here at WPI. What I'm going to be presenting to you today overlaps. I'm going to pull a lot of material from a presentation that Paul and I did on Wednesday for students. Primarily, the goal of this is to communicate expectations. And they said they had 11,000 out, and over half of those have never. Okay, I think I have to figure out how to mute folks. Mute. Okay. Am I okay now? Okay. Yeah. Yep, you're good. Okay. I'm gonna keep yeah, good. Okay. I want to give one warning here at the start. Um, as you're going through this presentation, you're going to see lots of pictures of students and faculty without face coverings, and they're going to be closer than six feet apart. Okay. These are old pictures. I want to emphasize that. No students or staff or faculty were harmed in the making of this presentation. This is a COVID safe presentation. One of the key messages for the students was the following. I've got too many things in the presentation. A lot of things about college, a lot of things about WPI, a lot of things that they've experienced are completely different. Number one, you're going to meet their RA and he's going to be wearing a mask. Number two, a classroom like this is not going to happen. You know, they're not going to be meeting in Kinnipet Hall with 140 students and a math professor. It will not happen this year. On the other hand, I think what is really important will be unchanged. And I want to emphasize the things that are unchanged. First one is we've got two goals for every WPI student. And I've been talking about these two goals for many, many years. One is students at WPI will become an expert. They're going to learn the discipline, they're going to get the answers right. This is about the courses they take, this is about the major they complete. This is about becoming an expert. But if you come to WPI, our other goal for you, it's a parallel goal, is to solve real problems. And these don't live in departments, they don't live in courses, they don't live in disciplines. This is more about asking the right questions than it is getting the answers right. This is about projects, it's about learning. This is what WPI's approach to education really is all about. Going back more than 150 years, our motto is theory and practice. And I think that middle word is probably by far the most important. We don't have theory then practice. We don't have three years of um, background courses after which you get to work on something real. We blend those two things explicitly, regularly from the very, very beginning. Theory informs practice. Practice makes theory real. Key message that I gave to the students was the following. 
what do faculty expect? And this is a faculty expectation. It's a quote from an advisor to a student. She said, if you treat your classes like a full-time job, you will graduate in four years and you will graduate with high distinction. Basically, we expect you to succeed. And what I really hope to see you know, in 2024 May is I get to high five every student when they cross the stage. 1300 high fives, by the end of the day, my hand is pretty sore, but it's one of the best days of the year. I gave the students a quiz on Wednesday and the quiz was the following. I wanted to ask them how many classes they were taking. And they looked at their schedules and many of them answered three. The correct answer is six. This is a question really about units. They are taking six courses per semester. And if they're thinking about the workload that they should be planning for, that they should be structuring their schedule around, it's not a three course schedule, it's really a six course schedule. And the key is they're doing everything in seven week terms. Classes start on August 31st. The first term, A term will end on October 16th. For those seven weeks, they will have three courses to focus on. There'll be a two day break, weekend plus a Monday and a Tuesday, followed by another seven week term ending in December. The thing that I want to emphasize about that, and this is one of the toughest things for students to adapt to is, if you miss a few days at WPI, you miss a lot. You miss a lot in each of those courses. And if you're gonna be out, you have to communicate that as quickly as you can to the professor or to your advisor. One of the key roles that the advising office plays is when a student does miss classes, the advising office will reach out to their, their faculty and let them know that they're out. Key points of advice are, you've got to begin before you're ready. You've got to work in short bursts. You've got to do something every day. And you've got to communicate early and often. Okay. I'll present this as sort of a dangerous view of a student's schedule. When they look at their, re at their scheduled course times, they'll see you know, 15 to 17 hours a week in which it looks like they have to be doing something academic. But if they look at just these scheduled times, this is not a full-time job. And if they only thought of their education as being in these scheduled times, they'll do very badly. They won't graduate, they won't pass their classes. They've got to think about a schedule in which every one of those classes is really about 15 hours a week. And they have to take the responsibility of scheduling their time around the stuff where they're in classes or they're in labs or they're online. The other point that I want to emphasize is one of the really interesting changes this year is they're going to have to schedule when they eat. Okay, they're not going to be able to walk down to the dining hall or the campus center and just decide to eat lunch or breakfast or dinner whenever they wish. They're going to have to reserve tables. They're going to have to schedule that. I actually think that's a positive thing. Put it in their schedule, make it part of what they plan. The other thing that I emphasize, and this actually is advice that came from students, after you've put together your schedule and you've, you've figured out when you have to be in class and how you're going to study and when you're going to study, schedule your downtime also. Schedule the time when you're in clubs and organizations. Join a couple of clubs and put that in your schedule. Make it real. Okay. So we've got some tools for helping students do that. And I want to just, this is a little bit of a side tangent. One of the things we had to do for D-term for last um, spring when we sent students home and through the summer, we put together a lot of support for students who were learning online for the first time. But I actually believe that fundamentally all that advice we put together for online is generally true, it's generally valuable. We're continuing to use that same mechanism to provide support and advice and connection for students, whether they're on campus or online this fall. Every week there's gonna be a newsletter that goes out to students with just-in-time tips. One of the pieces of that newsletter is actually a survey where we collect feedback from students. It's very brief, it's very, um, um, it's not um, detailed. We're just trying to get feedback on what's working and what's not working. There's also a website and an email address, virtual learning, where students can submit questions and we track those and make sure they get to the right place. Your son or daughter has been probably reading about what we're calling TechFlex. 
there are really three main modes for course delivery for this fall. First one is online. There are some classes which are fully online, which means there is no in-person meeting on campus. What's a little bit where you need to be a little bit careful here is some of these classes are, they may be online, but they are requiring synchronous participation. So there are meeting times and you have to be in the meeting on Zoom or whatever method they're using at those times. Other classes are fully asynchronous. You can access the materials anytime. You can contact the professor or the teaching assistant anytime. It's not scheduled. I can't tell you from the schedule and the students can't see on the schedule whether their class is synchronous or asynchronous. You can only get that information by going to the course website, looking at the details or emailing the professor. The vast majority of classes are what we're calling hybrid. They've got a face-to-face -face experience for all students on campus, but they are also accessible to students who are online, okay? So these are a mixture. Most classes are in this form. We have some classes that really do require mask to mask or face to face on campus participation. The vast majority of these are labs of some form. So like you can't do the um, biomedical engineering surgery lab virtually. You can't do it at a distance. So most of these are upper class or more advanced courses. Some of them like I think I was talking to one of the parents earlier, John, if your son or daughter is in chemistry this fall and they plan to be online, they will not be able to complete the labs this fall. They will get an incomplete in the class. They'll have to do that at a later time. Okay. I wanna say a little bit about our grading system. You may have heard about this or read about this already, but it's unusual. At WPI, as a parent, you can see the final grades in the portal. You will see grades for six, or more courses, depending on how many are registered, unless there was an NR. So NR means no record, which means it is not recorded on the transcript, okay? So if a student signed up for seven classes and they got five A's and two NRs, all the report will show are the five A's, okay? Aside, and that is number one, this is one reason we don't compute GPA. So a student who got five A's and two NR's, someone looking at that transcript might think that's a 4.0. I guess in theory, in, in reality, it's not. That's part of the reason we do not compute a GPA at WPI. To determine academic standing, to determine the Dean's List, we don't use GPA then. In order to remain in good standing, you have to pass four courses in each semester. If a student NR's a course, the advisor is notified and Paul's office reaches out to them to work on improvement plan to find out what sort of support they need. We track it pretty carefully. There are nine words we usually use in communicating with students. It's go to class, do the work and ask for help. Probably the toughest of those nine is the last three. Most of your sons and daughters have never been the ones who had to ask for help. They were the ones that other people went to to ask for help. They were the ones that always knew how to do the problems. They're going to get to a place here, we hope, where they get challenged and they do need to ask for help. The place to start are the faculty and the teaching assistants for their classes. And the thing that I want to emphasize here is you don't wait till there's a problem to ask for help. You go to see them, you get to know them, you communicate with them, whether it's virtual or in office hours. You go to them to learn more about the material, to learn more than is absolutely necessary. Another place where support happens for first year students in particular is called the insight programs. Every first year, every first year student is part of an insight team. This includes an advisor, faculty or staff. It can use an undergraduate peer community advisor that works with the students on special programming during the first two terms. And if they're living in one of the residence halls, it's a resident advisor. This program is put together to start making connections as early as possible. Fundamentally, I guess I would refer to it, it's, it's an intrusive approach to advising where we, we go to the students instead of asking the students to come to us. Two pictures, there's a real RA, there's a real community advisor, both wearing masks. 
every student has another extra advisor in the Office of Academic Advising. During this summer, every student's schedule has been reviewed in detail by this extra advisor. If there are any questions, that person has been reaching out to your son or daughter to find out if they really did mean to sign up for four grad classes in their first two terms or not. Basically to work with them to make sure that they've got their schedule settled. Students will be asked to declare their major in December. When they do that, they'll be reassigned an advisor in that department. You know, until that time, fundamentally, we assume that all students are undecided. In the first year class, typically one of the largest groups that we have are undecided. So it's not unusual. Okay. There's another layer of support and I referred to this a little earlier with the virtual at WPI. So there's a group of students in my, group, excuse me, group of staff in my office whose job is to reach out to, when students reach out to us, if they've got a question, they don't know where to go, we can find the right office, we can answer the questions, okay? I'll go back to the two goals, I'll just reiterate them. Every student is gonna become an expert. This is about maybe the more traditional part of learning. This is the stuff you need to learn in the classes. But you're gonna to learn to solve real problems. You're gonna be ready to go on your IQP. You're gonna be ready to work on an MQP in the senior year. This is about project work. This is about projects. This is about what learning I think really means. Again, it's theory and practice. We're gonna challenge your sons or daughters. We're gonna challenge your student to work on things before they've got all the background they need. If you think about working through the rest of your life, you've never got all the classes you need before you start something. You've got to be ready to hit the ground running. So I finished there. I tried to be fairly quick, maybe a little bit too quick. So I'm going to turn off the slides. Just to reiterate, my name is Art. Paul is also on here. Our emails are at the bottom. It's Heinrich at WPI or P. Riley at WPI. I'll give Paul Riley's cell phone number in the chat when he's not looking. Welcome. He's joking, just to make sure. Yes, I am always joking. <laughs> so. Right, there's been a few questions um, mm -hmm. regarding the parent portal. So mm -hmm. I'm going to just put that into the chat um, okay. with the, uh, the link. And if you scroll down, you'll be able to see that. There is one caveat with the parent portal is that your student needs to give you permission um, in order to be able to access that. Of course, there's... Uh, obviously real developmental reasons for that. So having a conversation with your student about that. So I'm just gonna uh, pop that in there so you can see and then scroll down, you'll see there are instructions for parents and for students about getting access to that. I just had an error pop up say that my speaker is not working. Can you hear me, Paul? You are about 30 seconds or 45 seconds. It was a little choppy, but otherwise uh, I heard you loud and clear for the rest of the presentation. Okay, I'm, I'm actually choppy in person most of the time too, so, okay. So do you want to, Christine, you want to help out with questions or how should we do this now? Sure can. I'm over here ferociously writing um, through the chat. So hopefully I, I won't miss any. Um, could you talk a little bit about the tools available um, in addition to grades for parents to monitor student progression or, or maybe some tips? Okay. You know, number one, Parents do not have access to the individual or say weekly course grades. We won't, we won't give you access to the course website. You won't be able to see what your son or daughter can see. Most faculty maintain their grade books in Canvas on their course website and your son or daughter can see how they're doing there. Um, I would point to one other thing we do, and I think your son or daughter may not know this, but we monitor their, their login behavior on Canvas and if a student is not logging into the website, we get a report of that and we actually reach out to them to find out if something is wrong. So, so there's, a, there's a more intrusive side to the checking on their behavior there. All I can really say on the getting back to your original question is the best thing you can do is to ask your son or daughter how they're doing. You know, if you think there's a problem, reach out to us and we will reach out to them we will communicate with your son or daughter. If you think there's a problem, please let us know. I think that's important. But at the same time, we won't meet with you separately. We'll meet with you combined if you wish. Paul, do you wanna add anything to that? No, that's right on Art. I think it's, there's, there are comprehensive support systems in place to help your student both transition through our insight program 
um, and, I, and it is kind of early intervention to see what's going on. You know, arts team, of course, certainly with more of a virtual uh, support now looking at Canvas. And then, you know, students are typically taking three courses per term. We have some students who struggle. So if any student um, receives an NR in two of those courses, we contact the student, we contact the advisor, and we contact families as well. And we will have, uh, t you know, uh, family meetings if that's something that you and your student will want to have with an advisor. So lots of good support. Mm -hmm. We also have a comment about in the chat about students not receiving confirmations about their academic schedules. What should they do? Uh, that's a great, great question. So this summer we have um, I've been certainly super busy in regards to reaching out to students. And so we have been reaching out to students if there is any question that an advisor may have had about a schedule. So it might be like um, Dean Heinrich said, maybe it's a grad course. Maybe it's they decided that they wanted to start in a a lower level calculus than their maths placement recommended. And so we would reach out, but there are some changes to the student schedules. And so we've been making some changes this week in regards to calculus and, and physics. So um, we will be using the next two weeks, of course, to confirm student schedules, um, obviously primarily for a term, make sure they're in the correct courses for the major, their interest level. And then also if there's been any changes to um, courses. So whether it's a different time, um, and so, and then we also have our insight program. So there are multiple checks between now and August 31st to confirm that students are in uh, the correct courses for, for what they want to study. Thanks, Paul. Um, since WPI works on a condensed schedule, clearly we've got our term-based system. How would we handle students who might need to quarantine or isolate, but also are taking labs? Um, will there be opportunity to make up that time or will they, without having to repeat the lab? Yeah, I mean, so this is no, I mean, in some ways I want to answer like what happens with quarantine. It's obviously a different group of um, staff that could answer that, but I will say that um, it, it's different this year because certainly COVID is really at the front of our minds right now. And, uh, but we work with students in our area for if a student has to miss a uh, class, if it's a lab or a lecture for any reason, it may be a personal circumstance like they've got to go home or it may be mental health, it may be a physical health, they may have the flu in the winter. We will reach out to um, the faculty member once we've heard from health services and we will advocate for the students our faculty are wonderful in being flexible and creating options to help the students. So if they've missed a lab, there will be options to make up that lab later. So, um, and obviously thinking about when, when in the term this may occur, right? So if it happens right at the end of the term, we would work with the faculty and the student to perhaps um, take incompletes until the work is resolved. If it's earlier, we will come up with plans to make sure the student feels supported. So um, certainly this would be um, no different in the sense of our advocacy with COVID-19 um, this term. Um, and would you be able to talk a little bit more, more about what Canvas actually is? And um, if students have already received messages from professors along with assignments, um, you know, what are they supposed to do or watch before the start of classes? I think, um, do you wanna get that on Art? I think you're on mute there. Oh, maybe he's got some issues with his um, microphone. So I think, you know, with, with professors, they have been reaching out um, in some courses because there may be some time changes. And, but I would say it's typical that students don't necessarily get a lot of material or advanced notification weeks before the term begins. Normally a few days before the term, uh, information is posted on Canvas. So it might be a syllabus. It might be, you know, just an outreach from the professor saying who they are. And maybe there's um, some information about what the structure of the class is going to look like. And that happens usually a few days before the term begins, not necessarily a few weeks because we're, um, we're still in our summer term, right, Hart? So I know faculty are, are wrapping up their summer. Did my speaker come back on again? Yep, you're good. Okay, I apologize for that. This is the first time I've had problems on my speaker this end. So the, I think I'll just let you go on that one. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and um, so as uh, in a logistical uh, standpoint, uh, our summer classes are now going to get moved over and then our fall Canvas sites will start to get populated. And so students will start to see more information on Canvas uh, for their courses. And 
And Christine, this is the first year I think we've we've been really active on using Canvas for new student orientation. And so I think students are going to be really used to that platform to be able to get information. So I think just it's going to continue to grow out over the next few weeks. And, and Canvas is basically an academic platform that a lot of different classes will use to post assignments, modules, um, videos, um, but also it could be a, a side group project, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So there's an email going out to faculty today, basically reminding them that this year the students will need to have access to their Canvas sites early. So I know faculty have been working on them, but they don't always publish them until they're, they, you know, fixed all the details, yeah. but. Well, and the next question goes off of that a little bit. Will students, will, will they get their syllabuses prior to class starting so they know if and where they're meeting? Um, and will they have time to find where their classes are if they're meeting in person? Yes, and I actually think that probably the, um, one of the things that they do do in your student orientation through the inside teams is to make sure everybody knows where everything is. Yeah, so. Absolutely. We did have a campus. And I, I can confirm that we'll we'll be encouraging the, the community advisors to help um, get the students to where they need to be for that first day of class. So students yeah. should know where, where they're gonna go if they are taking in class um, mm -hmm. opportunities. We've had a couple of questions about textbooks and also just concerns about getting them in time with schedules that are still in flux. I don't know if someone can talk a little bit about the bookstore and those resources. I guess the one thing that I would point out is a lot of our textbooks have both paper and digital versions and the digital versions delivery is is immediate. The one other thing that I would add is our library has switched over to an entirely digital reserve system. So they've got reserved textbooks for most of the courses and a lot of and they are all digital copies now. So that's a resource that a lot of students aren't used to using, but it is available. So our bookstore has been reaching out and preparing. I think they're, I think we're in pretty good shape on that. Right. Um, there was a question about um, asking if someone could elaborate on the differences for freshmen that intend to be here for four years, whether that's a BS versus a, a four year master's degree. It can be, it can be both, I guess. It can, mm -hmm. vast majority of our students do bachelor's in four years. That's what our curriculum is designed to be. Uh, we do have a program uh, what we call a BSMS, uh, Bachelor's and Master's combined, combined programs. Uh, students can do that. We certainly have students that do it in five years. And we have students that sometimes do it in four years. So if uh, your student has a, either a lot of AP credit um, or transfer credit, or they really want to take a lot of summer classes, we can help them uh, sometimes make that happen in four years. And we, of course, we, uh, we work with the faculty closely to make sure that students are doing it for the right reasons, not just necessarily a credential. And sometimes that means doing an undergrad and a master's in the same discipline, maybe it's robotics, or uh, students do an undergrad in engineering and decide to do a grad degree in business. And so there's, there's different ways, depending on what the students may want um, to do both study-wise, but also get it for their career. A lot of the students are coming in with with AP credit or some other version of transfer credit. And it's not unusual for students to finish either double majors or a BSMS program in four years. Your kids are smart. Sure are. Um, we do have a, uh, one question about um, are schedules finalized? I don't know that schedules are ever really finalized, but Paul, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the add drop date and, um, you know, as students are looking to finalize their schedules, if they have a wait list, what that might mean for them? Yeah, great question. So we are, um, we're working a lot with, right now with um, looking at schedules. Course registration will open on Monday for, for students to make changes themselves. What I would, of course, recommend is that if a first year student is making a change, that they at least consult with an advisor in the short term and then their insight advisor to make sure that the course that they're um, changing meets their degree requirements, uh, et cetera. So we do have, um, and at that point the, on Monday, the wait list will start to move. So if there's a student that's, let's say there's an available seat and they're number one on the wait list, they may um, be offered that seat next week. And so then there'll be opportunities to uh, potentially make changes to their schedule. Um, we do have an ad drop period at the beginning of the term and it lasts for about two weeks uh, where students can make changes to their schedules. 
but we would recommend students if they are going to make changes they make them in the first couple of days because our terms of course are seven weeks so we do not want them to be missing uh, any course material and to make sure that they're successful in that course and that's why we have advisors so we will have uh, online drop-ins for any student who wants to connect with an advisor to make sure they're meeting their degree requirements well we've had a couple of questions about new student orientation um not sure if you want to speak to the insight program a little bit or um, the program in general but knowing we've got students who are moving in from the 26th through um the 29th um you know what what to expect during orientation Christine, I wouldn't mind kicking that back to you. You are okay. <laughs> you are our, our expert on our panel, so. I, I'm happy to. So new, new student orientation will be taking place starting on the 26th of August and moving um, straight through till the 30th, right before the first day of classes. I think one of the great things that we've been able to do is um, kind of taking this flexible approach. We're ensuring that students are getting the same resources and information no matter what day they move into the residence halls if they are living on campus. If students are coming to campus remotely, um, or I'm sorry, if they, are, um, if they are going to be fully remote, we also have an orientation program for them on Sunday, August 30th. Um, and the Insight program is a part of orientation. Students will be paired up in groups um, and they'll be given an, an Insight advisor, a resident advisor, and a community advisor in most cases. And those individuals will be working with the students not only throughout orientation but throughout the first two terms to help them acclimate to WPI to make sure that they have the tools and the resources that they need to be successful. Um, and we have several meetings with those groups throughout orientation. Some of those will be virtual, some of those will be in person. We also have some trainings for the students to go through and we have social activities in the evenings. Um, almost all of those are virtual opportunities so that everyone is able to participate. There is information on the NSO Canvas site. There's a master schedule. Um, it's in draft form right now because things are always changing. Um, but <laughs> information as up to date as possible is on the NSO Canvas site that um, both students and parents should have access to. Um, if anybody does have any questions about NSO specifically, I'll put our alias in the chat and I'm happy to answer those offline. So there's one question, additional question about if it starts on the 26th, but it don't arrive till the 28th. I think the point is student orientation this year is sort of modular enrolling so that Correct. all the yep. programs will be available. So everyone's going to have the same move in experience. They're going to move into the residence hall. There's going to be an evening insight team meeting for those students. And then they'll move into the next day um, with, with specific training and with um, CA led activities. So when you do, if you are arriving on campus, when you check into um get ready to get into the residence hall there will be a schedule that's specific to the date of your orientation move-in um, and we're really going to be folding the students into their insight teams so um, they're going to have that opportunity to connect with students um, throughout the time whether they show up on the 26th or they show up on the 29th um, what I really mean. um moving on we did have one question about um you know, when, when, and I think Paul, you touched about this a little bit, but the wait list, when is it going to be solidified or when would students get those email notifications? Well, we expect those uh, notifications to start going out next week. And uh, of course we um, working all weekend to continue to work on the schedule. I think we're, we're nearly there. Um, and so, but Monday students can make changes themselves and go on and then the registrar's office are the ones responsible for kind of moving the wait list um, before the beginning of the term, right? So, and then, you know, we have that period of time where students can connect with faculty members to discuss potentially getting into their course. Um, you know, obviously this year is a little bit different, but there may be some online courses that might have some more flexibility. Certainly we see that the in-person courses, um, we will certainly be deferring to the faculty member to um, go over exactly how they're gonna run those hybrid experiences because we certainly don't want more students in classes than, than shouldn't be based on the, the classroom restrictions. There were a couple of questions that I saw sort of highlighting the fact that there are many different, you know, you've heard about banner web and Canvas and email. I would emphasize you know, what Paul just talked about. Email, you've got to get used to monitoring your email at WPI. That's the official channel for communication. So things like if you're gonna be offered a seat say let's say you're on a wait list for a section you want to get into you get an email saying this is available and you have to you have to then act on that email and say okay yes i want that seat 
if you don't read that email for 48 hours, you'll lose the seat. It will go to the next person on the list. So, you know, I have to admit that I smile periodically. I had a meeting with some um, seniors earlier this week and they were complaining that they said it was amazing. They got as many as two or three emails every week about something at WPI. And I'm thinking I get 200 a day. So two or three a week sounded like a wonderful thing to me. It's an adjustment to make, you know, I think, and I, I don't want to minimize it, but it, it is something you have to get used to. BannerWeb is sort of the business operations hub for students and faculty and staff. Canvas is where you get information about courses, probably an additional academic programs. And I think Christine, some clubs use Canvas. As you might expect, you know, I, I was also smiling when I saw the list of, you know, the, the, the different platforms students have to get used to. I work a lot with student organizations and they've got about another 35 or 40 that I'm not used to. Slack is probably the most common one that I see. Um, many, 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 many more. So. Um, I also think that we, we also try to make sure that it's a one-stop shop too. So students, there, there are websites where students can go and they can click on all of those individual resources in, in one place. So it, it's not as, as cumbersome. Um, one question that we did have, oh, it moved on me. I know I, I'm not quick enough either. I lost it. Um, I know we shared this a little bit before the call started, but someone was curious about the percentage of students who are coming to campus versus those who are gonna be fully remote. It's about 85% of students have elected to be on campus. 85% of undergraduates are on campus and 15% of it elected to be remote. That seems to be a little bit, um, you can change your status, I'll just put it that way, and some students are. So Christine and Paul talked earlier about reaching out to students. So we've got, I've got a, I was talking to a faculty member earlier today who had a student who they know is actually living on campus but opted for a remote class. And they're trying to figure out what the real, what their real plan is. To my mind, the, the place that I want to emphasize the importance of that decision is if you are going to be on campus, then you have to be participating in the test, the COVID testing protocol. So if you're living on campus, you're going to be tested twice a week. If you're commuting from campus, you're tested at least once a week. Christine, am I right about that? I believe so, yes. So, you know, that's where, you know, the the on-campus, off-campus is important from that sort of academic side, but it's also important from the health testing side. Uh, there's been a few questions about access to the library, especially for fully remote students. Um, mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about what the resources will look like this year? Number one, the library has actually moved all of their research library and instructional support entirely virtual. So that's available on campus and online and just probably more available online now. I mentioned earlier that the reserve system has moved entirely to a digital textbook reserve system. That's available to everyone on campus or online. You know, maybe the, the only part of the library services that I would say is not available is as a place to study. You know, if you're an online student, that's the only thing you can't do with our library right now. Paul, would you add anything to that? No, it's a great resource, Art, and, and, and they've got wonderful staff over there, and I think a lot of the work can be done remotely. And so I think students are going to, mm -hmm. to benefit from probably even more access to online, online resources. Mm -hmm. um, trying to go through here. Uh, there was a question about, I, I believe, why the Hampton Inn is being used as a residence hall, and that is to help us de-densify um, our our residential spaces yeah. um, and will there be opportunity for students to connect virtually with their inside team prior to the arrival um, for NSO um, given that there is both virtual and in-person parts with masks and social distancing um, I don't believe at this time that we have any plans for students to get together virtually prior to NSO um, but we will be um, 
you know, certainly encouraging students to connect during NSO, and then those insight groups will also be doing programming throughout A and B term. Um, so they will spend a lot of time together. Um, uh, that I'd say it's one of the significant parts of NSO itself, and and so whether your student is coming in on I guess the first day, the twenty sixth or twenty, there will be significant um, programming provided, um, not just remote, but there's going to be some in person as well. And insight is a huge component of that, so they'll get to meet um, their their team at that time. Um, Art, there's been a few questions about how many first year students. Uh, are going to be online. I think I thought I saw about a hundred or so. Is that correct? Out of the thirteen hundred, that was the what? That was the number I saw also. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know the percentages better than I do. I'd have to get the calculator <laughs> out, but uh, it's certainly n north of ninety percent, right? They're going to be on, yep. on campus. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are beds and furniture being removed from the dorm rooms that are being de-densified? I think the answer is yes. Yes, I think depending, it, it's different, I believe, for each residence hall. I know, like, for example, in Daniels, I think they've removed the bed and the, I think they've also removed the desk, but the closets um, are still there. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the specifics, but I think it does, it's dependent upon where they are. So I guess the, but I don't think we can customize that. So I think they're doing all that now. Yes. When the students arrive. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a question about um, how quickly test results are being provided. Um, we're seeing test results um, in less than 24 hours right now, but as I think campus gets more populated, that might take a little bit more time, but I believe that we're supposed to receive results within 48 hours. Yeah, our contract with the Broad Institute, they've, they've promised 48 hour delivery. We're seeing 24 hour right now. We're doing what, about 200, 300 tests a day right now, Christine? Um, a day, yes. I think we're doing over over a thousand a week. Yeah. yeah. Um, how will we academically support students who would be in isolation or quarantine spaces? It's the same way we would support any online student. So the same support we provided for them. So basically, if someone is moved into quarantine, we would be treating them as a student who was a remote student for that small period. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and it also depends on how people are feeling, right? It's not just necessarily about moving into quarantine, but students may, may not feel well, and that mm -hmm. and we're always sensitive. You know, sometimes a student may get a concussion, and so what is the appropriate way to support that student in an academic way while they're dealing with you know something that is hard for them to process information? So the good news is that we have got. Um, we've got so many people that can support the students in different ways, and we actually work together um, on a weekly basis to to help kind of triage different levels of support. So whether it's academic support, it may be res life support, it may be health services. There are there are teams that um, are dedicated to call our care team. Mm -hmm. I've seen a couple of questions about what will be in the Hampton Inn. I guess I had talked to a student who's living there, and they had gotten pretty explicit descriptions of what was going to be in the room or what they could bring. Christine, can you say more about that? To be honest, I am not quite sure, but I, if, if folks do have questions about residential buildings um, or the, the, the Hampton Inn, which is acting as a residence hall this year, if you do want to include your email address, I can connect with our colleagues in residential services and then follow up with the correct answer because I don't want to, I want to give people the, the right information if they've got specific questions. It's the double tree that has the cookies, right, Hart? <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe uh, maybe I don't have to get cookies, but you know, it's a it's a good resource for our students. So, is there, um, you know, in in your experience, is it important or should students think about bringing a printer um, to to hand in assignments, or are most submitted electronically? I actually think most are submitted electronically now. Um, you're asking somebody who is. You know, I'm so old that I actually think everything should be printed still. But, you know, I, a lot of faculty are taking only digital submissions now. So, and there are um, networked printers available to students in many places on campus. Um, 
Um, I do see that there's been some questions too about testing. Um, most students at this point, I believe, have or should have received, um, I believe some students have received emails about testing. So I would encourage um, to, your student to look at their email to see if they've received any notification from the Dean of Students Office. Mm -hmm. um, or check out the We Are WPI um, website for, for information. I've seen a couple questions about um, who should I reach out to if the student is sick? And I, first step is always the, the professor. Just email your instructor directly. So just send an email to the faculty member and say, you know, I'm, 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 I'm ill, I'm gonna be missing in a couple of days. That's the first step. If you don't hear back from the professor, the second step would be Paul Riley's office or your academic advisor. Paul, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, health services, um, yeah. checking in with them, um, certainly on campus, right? So um, mm -hmm. your student may have an off-campus resource, but we want to make sure that our on-campus resources can help too. And and then they, um, the health services would notify our office and they wouldn't notify us um, based on what your student may be dealing with. It may be any health. They would just say, that your, that your student will be out of class from X day to X day. And we would advocate then for your student and let the faculty members know so that their, their health information is kept private. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the policies we have that I communicate to faculty every year is you cannot require a doctor's note for an excused absence, you know, period. You know, every once in a while, a professor will say that. Most of those professors are my age or older. And so 26 we're older um, I apologize I'm trying to go through some a, lot of, ones. a lot of good questions a lot of great questions yes. Um, th someone did ask if this session is going to be recorded and yes it is being recorded and um, we are also um, adding them to the NSO Canvas site under pre-recorded uh, pre sessions. Um, so once we have this recording ready, um, we can add some captioning and we'll get it uploaded for people to reference. And you're going to fix my voice too at the same time? <laughs> That's beyond my, it doesn't need fixing. That's right? what Andy's here for. <laughs> Christine, where do we land in regards to the Canvas site being public or where would parents be able to get like a copy? Will we be posting something either on the web so they know what their students may be um, working through. Is that for new student orientation? Correct, yeah. So the NSO Canvas site, parents and students should have received an email from me um, the first week of August on the 3rd um, with a link to the Canvas site. So that is one of the best places to go. If you click on files, you should be able to see the NSO schedule. Um, I did see a request in there to have it added to the website and we will certainly uh, do that. As you can imagine, we are still um, making some, some modifications and changes as we're trying to assign dining times and locations for folks, um, but we um, will certainly be able to post that online once it's in a little bit more finalized form. We're almost there. We have to go to print, so I have to be almost there. <laughs> Because I saw a question about students, percentage of students in doubles and singles. I'm looking that up right now. It's pretty low. I mean, pretty high. Do you remember, Christine? Um, the percentage that we've moved to? Yeah. Or that we used that we used to be. I, I don't have that information on this. My fingertips. I believe we're like 87% singles and doubles now. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely um, de-densified to, to doubles and singles. Yeah, so the one person referred to an eight-person suite. So my guess is they're in um, Founders or they're in um, Ellsworth Fuller townhouses. So those are three-bedroom, basically three-bedroom apartments down there. Is that right? I'm think. not that familiar with Founders. Yeah. Um, but again, if, if folks do have specific questions, if you private message me and provide an email address, I'm happy to connect with our colleagues and, and get back to you with that. Yeah. Um, Any more new messages? There's a question about as first year start students starting as undecided. And so mm -hmm. uh, students do list a major when they apply to WPI. Uh, and uh, we work with the registrar's office in uh, changing students' majors when they've decided 
possibly to do something different and assigning them a faculty advisor in their major typically is done at the end of the fall so but i would say that uh, maybe 40 50 percent of students will actually have changed um, from what they was listed on their application but there is also about 50 percent that will um, remain with the same major so uh, it is a time of course that a time of academic exploration and so students are going to take courses they may fall in love with something and they may decide to change their major the good thing is that we, they all they have multiple advisors that can assist them to make sure they can still um, graduate and also make sure that they're taking the courses every term to match up with those degree requirements yeah i think in my presentation i said something like we treat most students as undecided i think roughly 15 percent coming in have declared themselves to be undecided. So we have a lot of students that, the, the majority of students have declared a major, but about 50% will change that at some point. I do believe we did have a question. I was just kind of looking up from my responses from Wednesday's session about if um, someone's roommate decided to do online classes and to not be on campus, would they have a roommate? Um, and with the answers, with so many students anticipating returning to campus and B and C terms, um, yes, a student with a space in their room should anticipate a roommate at some point during the academic year. Mm -hmm. I see a question about if you can't get into the parent portal, whom can we reach out to for help? Um, first thing is certainly make sure your student um, has given um, you permission. I, I think that would happen probably in the next few weeks. Um, but the registrar, the registrar's office um, are the ones that coordinate the parent portal. So it's registrar at WPI.edu and they will be the appropriate people. But definitely talk to your student. Uh, they will need to give you that permission for access. I'm tracking back up through, I'm trying to see. Uh, do parents need their own account on Canvas? I do not believe so, at least for the, the NSO page that the parents um, should have access. It's a public link. Yeah, there are some, there are public sites on Canvas, correct. And yes, Paul, if, if you um, can scan for some questions, I can try yeah. to find the Canvas link and put it in the chat for folks. Yeah, perfect. Um, I like when people say we're doing hard work and they're impressed. That's always a good thing. So um, I think we all know that you're all doing, you've been doing a lot of work too. And your students are probably uh, maybe taking courses remotely in their spring or possibly in the summer. So uh, it's kind of a shared experience in very, very different ways of um, trying to help your students, right? And that's the goal. So, and we know the transition can be uh, different and challenging uh, in any given year, maybe a little bit more this year, but I think there's certainly um, tons of resources. So there are, you know, um, Dean Heinrich and I do these sessions, of course, to make us um, accessible to you, right? And so we have, uh, of course, multiple people that can answer your questions. Uh, but at any point, certainly from an academic standpoint, feel free to reach out to to both of us. Um, I'll give you our cell phone, um, you know, at any point. So, um, so I think, you know, as we kind of, as you transition in, you know, the next few weeks, um, Take a look at the Canvas site as well. There are going to be a number of resources on there. We'll make sure if there's any logistical issues about getting on, getting a sense of what your students are going to be experiencing when they when they hit campus. And um, and as they transition, you know, I think having some questions for them about their transition. Um, you know, I know that when I came from Ireland um, to go to college, I wanted to do it myself. You know, I didn't want my parents involved. I said, see you later. And they were in Ireland. So... There, sometimes your students will over communicate or under communicate, but um, asking those questions about how they're transitioning, are they meeting people? Um, what are the social opportunities that they're involved in and how are they transitioning to courses? And, uh, and keep asking those questions, even if they don't open up on, the, on um, their first interactions with you. So if you notice anything, certainly getting in touch with Art and I, where we can also kind of be eyes and ears on the ground as part of the community. So, um, mm -hmm. There was questions about making sure that um, their students uh, either email or the parents' information is accurate so that we're communicating. Art, who's a, is there any best person on campus that um, they could refer them to make, if it's an address change or an email change, um, who should they get in touch with? Yeah, I would start with the registrar's office on that. Is that 
you know, that's sort of the, the keeper of the data, the primary keeper of data, you know, and, and always, you know, I'll just reiterate what Paul said. I don't know the answers to all the questions, but I usually know who to ask. So if you send me an email and say, you know, how do I get X done? I'll share the message with the right people and I'll get them back to you. I did see one question about, you know, PC versus Mac. Um, no official preference. If you spend any time with the computer science faculty, you see a whole lot more Macs than you will PCs. And I think that's just a matter of arrogance on their part, but it's a religious thing that I don't want to get really involved in. <laughs> Uh, there's been a good number of questions kind of about the testing procedures and of course that's changing um yeah you know i know art you've been on um cert as kind of our planning group um mm -hmm. maybe you could kind of talk about like the level of kind of work behind the scenes that's that's gone on from a holistic standpoint to make sure wpi is ready yeah. um to to bring students back to campus and and the different pieces and who maybe families should connect with you know, I would say two things, I guess, maybe to reassure you because it reassures me. And that is I'm a member of the coronavirus emergency response team. And we've been meeting since basically February. We've had more than 45 meetings and reviewed almost 3000 PowerPoint slides in the last several months. We've been digging into the details and the weeds of safety and testing and cleaning and planning twice a week for three hour meetings. And we've had staff, everyone from the president down to the direct, to the folks that are the safety officers. And the one thing that sort of makes me confident is I think we've been working the details on this for months to try to figure out, can we bring people back to campus safely? Um, so to my mind, I think I'm, I'm confident that we're not going to be surprised by anything. We've got a pretty good idea and we've planned for a lot. The Side to that that I would emphasize is maybe it's not too surprising that WPI would take a fundamentally redundant engineering approach to this. We have layers of safety, layers of protocol. We're not relying on the hope that one key component will not fail. Everything's got a backup somewhere. With all that said, we take it very, very seriously. And one of the plans we've been discussing most um, in detail most recently is when and how and why would we have to roll back and send students home? So we have identified a list of about 25 triggers that we would cause us to make that decision. So I'm only presenting that just to, just to try to give you some sense that we've spent many hours planning so that students and faculty and staff can be on campus safely in the fall. Um, with that said, I think we're being also being pretty realistic about it all. So um, I think one of the reasons the WPI is willing to continue to operate with students on campus and other schools are, are stepping back is they haven't been doing the planning at the level that we have for as long as we have. And I think I'll blame it all on the engineers. And I'll do that because I'm a math major and I, I'm a mathematician and just watching how the engineers think about this is pretty impressive. So, Paul, did I completely dodge your question? No, no, absolutely. Um, I think we've got about maybe two minutes left. I think we're scheduled to four o'clock. Art, I'm not going to give my age, but I, I don't have college age kids yet. There are one is in high school, one is in middle school, and one's two years old. Um, so um, I will be facing the college experience maybe in the future, but I certainly work with a lot of students transitioning. Maybe Can you share, Art, maybe some tips or advice to families out there now that are maybe supporting their first student or maybe their last student or any student in between about how they can help them successfully transition um, just to college in general, not necessarily even about these kind of challenging times. You know, I, you know, one of the things that I feel this year for the first time is I think in the past I might have been more than just a little bit glib about this kind of a question because we, I've been at WPI for 28 years and I've had a pretty good idea of what works and doesn't work. And I can't say that this year. This is one of the most, you know, things are not normal. Things are, um, things feel very, very uncertain. That level of uncertainty for students and faculty and staff, I think we're working through. Um, but at the core, I still think the fundamental goals that we maintain are the same. 
you know, we have a purpose for education here and we have a purpose and I'll, I'll frame it in two ways, I guess. Um, one is if you were a science or engineering major when I was and you were welcome to your campus, the standard welcome was look left, look right. One of you will be gone at the end of the first year. And the point was that you know, these were tough fields and only about two thirds survived, one third didn't. And that was deemed or viewed as okay. And I think the point was that it was a competition and, and only the fittest survived. WPI has long taken a very different approach. It's much more of a collaborative approach to education. It's believing that the only time you really understand something is when you explain it to somebody else and you work on a team and you work together. So the welcome that we've been using for a few years is look left, look right. These are the people who will help you the most. This is when you will learn the most. I guess in a Zoom world, I should be saying look left, look right, look up, look down. But it's still fundamentally true that education is social. The challenge now is figuring out how to do that in this environment and in this world. You know, we're doing everything we can to make sure that it's as safe as it can possibly be and maintain that level of social connection that I think is critical to education. So that piece of advice I would give is to get connected. The insight teams are designed to help your son and daughter do that. Um, it's more challenging because you can't do the accidental connections the way you used to in the residence hall or in um, on the athletics teams. So it's gonna take more effort. You have to be more intentional about making those connections. The last thing I would say is, and I always fundamentally believe this, you know your son or daughter, you know them. You know what's normal, you know the range of normal. If there's something that you feel is just extreme and it's making you worried, reach out to us and let us know. We'll contact them. We'll be really annoying and we'll bug them. I had a, a wonderful email from, we have a staff that's working on the virtual at WPI um, site that does that canvas tracking. So one of the staff that works for me, she checked the site and saw that a certain student hadn't logged in for two weeks. And on a seven week course, that's a problem. So she called them up and they answered the phone. And you know, the end of the story is the student admitted that they had been having problems with depression. They weren't able to do any work, but because my staff called them up convinced them they went ahead and talked to the professor. The professor gave them an extension. They're able to finish the course. It's that kind of outreach that matters to me. It's personal. And I've worked long enough at WPI to know that this is the way the WPI faculty and staff act. It's always personal. I'll leave it there. Christine, right. you want to correct me? No, I perfectly said. I um, I just want to thank um, you, Art, as our uh, Dean of Undergraduate Studies and Paul as our Assistant Dean of uh, Student Success for being here. Um, the, the the chat has been really active and so we will do our best to, to answer all of those questions. What I could, if I could ask everyone, um, if you did have a question that wasn't answered, if you could make sure that you repost it and provide your email address, that way we have a way to get back in touch with you. That would be wonderful. We don't want you to think that we forgot about you, but we certainly need to find a way to connect with you. Um, and if anyone does have any questions, you can email WPINSO at WPI.edu regarding new student orientation. Um, and we've also added um, more. There's another program next Monday with Charlie Morse, our assistant dean, um, for uh, the director of uh, sorry, director of the Counseling Center, um, who's gonna talk about student transitions and developmental issues as students make their transition from high school to college. We also have a student affairs panel next week. So there are still a number of programs for parents and students. We encourage your engagement um, and we're looking forward to seeing you all, whether that's virtually or in person in just a few couple, a few more weeks. So thank you all for your time and hope everybody has a great day. And if you see Charlie on Monday, tell him congratulations, because I think his son is getting married at his house this weekend. So, so they're having the small family wedding for his son this weekend. So, I'll be sure to congratulate him. Thanks for the heads up, Art. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. you.